And next we have Omi Bellu um, from Whale Cornell Medicine, transitioning from 2D to 3D brachy, reports from multi institutional experiences. All right, so um, I'm just going to get into it. Uh, so we know that cancer and cancer related deaths are rising. And as uh, Jim Lang and my, uh, the prior speaker uh, said, we know that there's a disproportionate burden in uh, low middle income countries where although they represent half of new cancer cases, they are accounting for nearly 70% of cancer deaths. And as we mentioned, there's the misconception that cancer is not a problem is not true. By 2030, it will be the leading killer um, in low middle income countries. So how do we address this? One solution would be to possibly increase the number of uh, radiation therapy machines. So uh, it's recommended that you have one machine per 120,000 people. And in North America, we have one machine per 105,000 people. As we said in uh, Latin America and South America, it's one machine per 640,000 people. And on the continent of Africa, it's one machine per 4.8 million people. So clearly some disparities that exist. So fortunately, there are programs that are trying to address this. Um, the IAEA has a program called PACT, whereby they come in and do an analysis, uh, assessment of the country, and then they help to provide uh, machines. But we all know that, uh, as someone alluded to before, it has to be done properly. If you use radiation therapy incorrectly, it can kill. And this is Scott Jerome Parks, who in New York, when they began implementing IMRT, he was overdosed in addition to some other patients, and it really caused quite the scandal and led to a series of uh, papers in the or articles in the New York Times. So it's very important that we target treatments properly and safely, uh, because especially when we do it in a country that has one radiation therapy center, you have the ability to make a big impact. So of course there's a learning curve with anything that you are trying to master, uh, whether it's learning how to put on our clothes, use the toilet properly initially, um, and of course with uh, transitioning from 2D to 3D radiation therapy, there's quite a steep learning curve. So this issue was on my mind, and when I was a resident, <clears throat> I decided to create a pilot curriculum for the implementation of breast radiation therapy. And it was supposed to uh, assess the feasibility of implementing this in uh, other countries as well. And so the workflow was supposed to be the first week, do an assessment and a queue, um, and a, do, do an assessment of the center, provide lectures, um, give pre-tests uh, pre before the lectures and a post-test after the lectures, and also do practical training and uh, simulation. And then week two would focus on contouring, uh, treatment plan design and evaluation, um, simulation um, of actual patients, and uh, feedback from the participants. So the first place I went to, of course, was Armenia. So uh, Armenia is a phenomenal country. I can't say enough great things about it. Good, few, um, good food and excellent people. But they only have two radiation therapy centers. And effectively, it's really one because the one in Yumri is actually very old cobalt machine that's probably possibly causing more harm than good. But in Armenia, um, breast cancer is the most common malignancy, so it seemed like an ideal place in which to pilot the curriculum. And I was very fortunate to have a chair, Dr. Formenti, as well as other mentors who really uh, helped me uh, pursue my passion, which is international global radiation oncology. So in Armenia, you know, this is the center. I work with a group of really dynamic, wonderful, lovely people. Um, and the first thing I did was the IAEA has a questionnaire whereby you can uh, assess what do you think are your uh, capabilities, what do you think are your weaknesses. So I sent this to them ahead of time to get a sense of what might be uh, their needs. And one of their needs was that they had a CT simulator that had been installed but the immobilization, the breastboard they had, had a, a metal rod that stuck up like this, and it would bang into the CT scanner every time they tried to use it. So they weren't using the CT scanner. So I checked in uh, a breastboard as luggage and brought it to them and drastically, yeah, drastically increased their use for uh, uh, breast cancer treatments. That was their new linear accelerator. And so we presented some lectures 
Um, and then we also did contouring tutorials together. I had them contour on their own first, and then we went through together what the issues were um, or what they did correctly. And this is uh, an example a co collection from the participants. The blue is the ideal contour of the breast using Educase, which is uh, what Astro uses for their uh, contouring tutorials. Um, and you can see that some people grossly under contour the breast, which can have a, a significant implications for being able to uh, cure someone. And in addition, looking at nodal contours, in these low middle income countries, um, locally advanced cases account for over two thirds of the presenting cases. So it's really important that they are able to target the treatment appropriately. And you can see that there were wide variations uh, when it came to contouring the superclavicular region. So overall, we had about eight professionals um, attend the lectures, three radiation oncologists, two medical physicists, and two radiation therapists. Uh, we held the contouring sessions with two radiation oncologists at a time, and the feedback showed that they thought it was the most useful aspect of the curriculum. But there were definitely challenges. <clears throat> uh, getting everyone to participate in all aspects of the curriculum when you're dealing with a high volume was difficult. Um, also, there was limited use of the CT simulator, even though we saw the issue of the, <coughs> the metal rod. Um, there's a cost. They have to charge more if you want a CT uh, simulation. Uh, so that kind of restricted us in that sense. And also lack of multidisciplinary participation. I was a resident and I came in and they said, okay, please set up the breastboard. It's in pieces. When you walk in um, here, the breastboard's already set up. You just come and see if the patient is appropriately set up. So I realized that I needed to get other individuals involved. So now um, we're hoping to move forward also with a gynecologic uh, curriculum for Armenia. And in, in addition, we're going to, we've been using teleconferencing to keep in touch and discuss breast cancer cases. And we're hoping to do the same with gynecologic cancer. This is our initial visit um, where I took a radiation therapist with me. Um, and of course, I was willing to, you know, be very hands on in the simulation activities. Um, in addition, we've also uh, piloted the curriculum with some changes in Gabon. So after the initial learning experience in Armenia, we went on to Gabon where, of course, breast cancer is the most common malignancy and uh, it represents about 52% of the female cancers that had been diagnosed. <clears throat> and we got a grant uh, from the Mario Ainali Center at Cornell University where we're implementing the breast curriculum, where we uh, implemented the breast curriculum. And uh, you can see in the first picture, top left, uh, that's the entire department. Again, I came with a radiation uh, therapist, and that is Louisa, uh, the young, tiny, petite little girl. Um, she was a research assistant that came with us, and Mohammed is the second from the right. He is an incoming radiation oncology resident, so it was great to get multiple people involved. Uh, and that enabled us to get a lot more done to administer pre-test and post-test. Uh, we um, did the assessment of their workflow on, in the initial days. We gave the lectures and we actually built a prone breast board while we were there. I tried to fly one from the States, but they ran out of supply. So we went to a carpenter and built a prone breast board in Gabon. That had its own issues, but in the interest of time, um, <laughs> reach out to me if you want to hear the details. Um, so again, uh, well, no, this time we had 13 uh, radiation therapy professionals. The pre-test uh, showed improvement amongst the radiation oncologists in, term, uh, in terms of what they picked up uh, from the lectures. Um, for the radiation therapists, that was, uh, it was less dramatic. Uh, there's still a lot of... Um, ground to be gained and uh, part of the issues may have been that there was a language barrier. So we attempted to translate the questions into French because uh, Gabon is a French speaking country, but I'm not sure that the material that we uh, gave, we gave it in English and then Mohammed who has a, who knows French, who's the radiation oncology incoming resident, he would translate but maybe something was lost in translation, so the radiation therapist just didn't pick it up as well. Also, they weren't as interested in contouring, even though they needed it. Um, I don't know if there was a dynamic of, there was a lot of males, and I don't know, if, I noticed that the women would contour with me, but 
a lot of the men stayed away, so I'm not quite sure what that was about. And in the, case of the medical physicist um, also requested that they have more medical physics related um, material. So moving forward, we're going to be looking to implement the curriculum in Ghana and also in Nigeria. And I welcome all you know and any interested participants and I wanted to thank Dan and all of the uh, individuals here because you're toiling away in your own corner and you have no idea what's going on or if anyone cares and to come here and see all the wonderful work that you're doing is really inspiring so thank you